Good morning, everyone. As you can see, this uh, panel of discussion will focus on human rights, advances, and uh, setbacks in Africa. Uh, let me make uh, one comment. Wherever I've been, particularly in the West, I'm always asked, can you name the worst country for human rights with, with eyes on Africa? Yeah, not so. There is not a country in the world with the perfect human rights record. And this we see in this UPR review. Every country in Africa, every member state of the United Nations has been reviewed twice already. Uh, the same criteria are, are used to uh, review the human rights records. Recommendations are made to those states by other states. And the focus now is on uh, implementing those recommendations. Every country in Africa has gone through this process. So I would say that there is um, a willingness to cooperate in this pro process, not necessarily a political will to implement some of the recommendations. I have, uh, as High Commissioner, traveled to many countries. And it's true there are violations in Africa far worse than, than in other countries. So they really need to do much more. Um, not in Africa, but in the Caribbean, for instance. I was the first High Commissioner to go to the Caribbean. And the minister was telling me how, how tourists come to Caribbean. Why do they come to the Caribbean? Because everybody's smiling. They're happy. If they were not happy, tourists won't come there. So really, no human rights problems in the Caribbean, she told me. <laughs> and I said, why do you beat your children? Oh, that, she says, that's a Caribbean culture. And I said, no, it's a 50-year-old British law that allows you. You remember, you can beat your wife with, with a rod no thicker than your thumb. So old British law. So that's one of the things that the Office of the High Commissioner does, is help countries to update their laws, because they've never paid attention to that. Then there are practices, harmful practices. Uh, this was Central, uh, Central Africa where uh, women and girls are detained for long terms for witchcraft. In this particular case, there was an 80-year-old woman and a 10-year-old girl, and I was urging the minister, and he had a judge next to him to let these people out. The 10-year-old uh, was declared a witch by the village because when she was born, something passed from the mother's body to her. And the minister said he can't release them because if he does, the village will lynch them or kill them. So where do you end the cycle? And I said, you have to start from the top by complying with the international standards, conventions that you adhere to. Um, so let me move on to say, why are we focusing on human rights? Because human rights violations are an alert to, to conflicts building. Syria started when there was a peaceful protest by people for their civil and political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights, because a vast swathes of population were excluded from the government. Government was uh, controlled by the Alawite group in Syria. So instead of holding a dialogue with those peaceful protesters, the Assad's government shot them. So 1,000 were killed, you will recall. And look where we are today, five years later, with almost 200,000 killed and millions and millions displaced. So that's why we say uh, human rights violations are an alert to conflict, so address it now. What I would like to say is uh, alternatives to prosecution, which is one of the questions here. Every commission of inquiry uh, set up by the um, Human Rights Council and the General Assembly, every investigation conducted by the High Commissioner for Human Rights or the Secretary General always ends up with recommendations for justice and accountability, uh, for national investigations and prosecutions. And every commission of inquiry has similarly urged national investigations, failing that, international or anyway, independent investigations. And here, let me name a few. There's commissions of inquiry on uh, Gaza, commissions of inquiry 
on uh, Syria, Libya, uh, and more recently, the uh, uh, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, North Korea. And, and North Korea is not a conflict situation, so that's another first for the UN to set up a commission of inquiry. It was chaired by a judge, former judge from Australia, Michael Kirby, and he held uh, public uh, sessions where he talked with witnesses in, who came out of North Korea in, into South Korea. They were, they were in exile. Um, so that is what these commissions do. They do fact-finding, they talk to witnesses, and in, in all those cases, the country under investigation has refused to allow these commissioners in. So the Syria commission that is going on now for, in its sixth year has not been allowed into Syria, except the chair, uh, Professor Paolo Pinero, was allowed to come alone. He shouldn't have gone. He should have insisted that the commission should go. But he went, and then they were not very happy with him when he uh, didn't come out with a, a report favoring them. Uh, so they did attempt to allow just him to come in. Which means uh, that all these commissions are very much in touch with civil society organizations in order to collect the evidence and um, verify them and ensure that they're factual. I was under so much pressure to come out with figures on the numbers killed in Syria. And we found that we were being manipulated on all sides by different people. And so we stopped for a while. And the Secretary General said to me, that is just no good. You have to come up with statistics. And I realized we have to do that to honor the victims. And that's, we finally drew a list of 200,000 at that one point with name, address, uh, you know, name, surname, where they were killed, and so on. So you can imagine what a huge effort that was. We had a great deal of help from uh, uh, experts uh, in, in other parts of the world. So that's what these commissions do. They make recommendations, which they, they even recommend which laws should be uh, changed. Obviously, they recommend respect for fundamental rights uh, and investigations. Uh, as long as I was high commissioner there, I ensured that there is always a, a, a judge, a retired judge sitting on these uh, panels. We have Judge Richard Goldstone, for instance, Judge Philip Kirsch, former president of ICC, uh, was the head of the Libya uh, Commission. Uh, I had Mary Davis, a U.S. judge on one of the um, Israeli uh, flotilla, or the, or the flotilla, the attack on the Turkish ship. And I had um, Carl Hudson Phillips, f former judge from the ICC on the Masai Mara, the uh, the uh, Israeli incident on, and, and this boat of protesters that went there. And of course, Michael Kirby uh, on, on the North Korea incident, you know, the, as a result of that commission, the Security Council imposed sanctions on North Korea. So it's really, uh, uh, even though there's no conflict, there's everyday conflict against the population in North Korea. So what are the remedies? Constant appeals to the Security Council, because that's the one body that um, can act in the matter. And military intervention being the final um, result. They look at other things. So interestingly, when I was leaving, then I was hosted by the, I addressed the Security Council, but the next day hosted by the P5. And yeah, they all get on there, I can tell you. <laughs> get on there. Um, yes. And what struck me is they, they had just come back from South Sudan. They had spoken to both the leaders. And they said, we don't have any enforcement powers. We don't have any tools. What do we do? So I think that's a good question for us, civil society, to, to think about what is it Security Council can do to get these not only in South Sudan, getting these two leaders, but also to get member states to comply with Security Council resolutions. 
to take the Security Council seriously. Um, so let me uh, stop there and, and say about the Syria Commission, after years of investigation, the member states realize that they have to investigate the crime base, not just the violations, because the situation was clearly uh, pro providing evidence of, of crimes being committed. And so Carla Del Ponte, the former prosecutor of ICTY and ICTR, is a member of the commission and she is investigating the crime base. And they've concluded that there's the facts point towards the commission of crimes against humanity and war crimes. Uh, so these are other mechanisms in which to address what we are, are looking at protecting human rights, but ensuring justice and accountability. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you very much. Round of applause for Ms. Nervi Pele. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and with those thoughts and um, some ideas on the best way to do it, I'm just going to introduce the actual panel. Uh, and uh, the introductions I'm going to use bear no resemblance to the true depth of knowledge that they, the, these, these two gentlemen and this uh, lady have, but they have to be brief for the purposes of actually having a discussion. <laughs> uh, Femi Falana is a human rights activist and lawyer from Lagos. Uh, Tianjana Malua, H. Laddie Montague Chair in Law, Pennsylvania State University School of Law, former Associate Dean for International Affairs School of Law and Director School of International Affairs. And Fatia Saru is the Director of Saru Associates for Inclusion and Equity in London. Um, that's the panel. The issue on the table is human rights in Africa, progress and regression. Um, each of uh, this distinguished panel will have 10 minutes, up to 10 minutes to present, and then after that, the, the the questions from the floor will be taken. And I will start as per the program with uh, Femi Falana. Thank you very much. Um, if you were around in Africa in the 70s and 80s, you are likely to believe that we have made significant progress in the enforcement of human rights, in the protection of human rights. In the 70s and 80s, human rights were violated with impunity by many rulers in Africa, very reluctant to call them leaders. Um, at that time, the Charter of the AU, or Organization of African Unity, OAU, made it impossible for concerned organizations and governments to interfere in the violations, gross violations of human rights in many of the African countries. But the crisis in Uganda under Idi Amin was mark a turning point in the protection of human rights in the continent. That was when the late president Julius Nyerere supported the invasion of Uganda under Idi Amin by Tanzanian troops. And the OAU conference of that year was very interesting. It was a case of whether we were going to continue to worship the non-interference clause or we're going to protect human rights wherever they were violated by doing away, the non, doing away with the non-interference clause. And I think that was when Africa resolved to defend human rights wherever they were violated. Of course, that led to the enactment, or rather the ratification, of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights in Nairobi, Kenya in 1981. And since then, the history of human rights in Africa has never been the same. Of course, we have the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, which is sitting in, uh, in the Gambia, uh, which of course has one of the worst human rights records in the continent. 
But that commission has been able to make a lot of recommendations, which in many instances have improved the human rights record in the continent. Of course, when the African Court on Human and People's Rights was set up, we had all thought that uh, we could use the instrumentality of the, of the court, that mechanism, to enforce human rights in the continent. But then we have Article 34, 6, which stipulates that your country has to make a declaration before you can access the court. And that clause has really inhibited uh, the enforcement of human rights in the continent. I was compelled about three years ago to sue the African Union before that court. Uh, it's challenged that clause because as far as I was concerned, since the African Charter, Article 2, has prohibited discrimination, uh, I thought I could access justice in the court. And my own argument was that uh, if my country, if the leadership in my country was irresponsible, as not to make a declaration to allow me to access the court. Why should my colleagues in Burkina Faso or Ghana be able to go to the court? Uh, of course, we had a split decision of 7-4 uh, against me to the fact that I had no local standard to challenge the African Union. Um, but then we've tried to access that court through the African Commission. Again, We've been met with a lot of frustrations. I and mean, we take the case in Burundi. For some of us who believe in preventive measures uh, before things really uh, assume dangerous dimensions, I filed a petition early last year to the African Commission that my complaint be referred to the court because I saw that there was no basis for the manipulation of the constitution by the president of that country. Um, the African Commission refused to send my petition. Of course, I've also tried to sue the African Commission now for failing to send the commission. So we found a lot of frustrations on the continent. Uh, the only region which has been able to address the question of human rights violations is uh, West Africa with the echo was caught. Again, it wasn't easy. We had to push and push and push before we were able to have the human rights, the jurisdiction of that court expanded to the enforcement of human rights in 2005. But between then and now, the court has recorded tremendous progress in terms of enforcing human rights in West Africa. Of the 15 member states of the ECOWAS, um, we've been able to drag quite a number of them to the court. Uh, as I said, Gambia has the worst case of human rights uh, violations in West Africa. And when we started to drag the Gambia to the court, it simply refused to come to the court. Well, we're not, you cannot bind us by your decisions. We're not going, we're not going to come to the court. But after a judgment was given, and that was the case of Ebrima, a journalist who was detained and who could not be located, uh, the Gambia had to rush back to the court, you know. And since then, Gambia had been trying to defend all cases filed against it in the court. Uh, but the, the, the problem with the court, uh, because I was telling my colleague yesterday, Abdul, who was pressing the court to high heavens, I mean, uh, the progress we have made. Yes, we have a number of judgments, but out of the 50 member states, only about four or five have shown, um, have tried to comply with the judgments of the court. So you have a court that gives good judgments in the area of human rights, but those judgments are not enforced. But my own uh, position on human rights in Africa, yes, we have made some progress. We no longer have the Idi Amin's, the Guemas, the Abachas, and the rest of them. But in terms of human rights for the majority of our people, yes. we haven't not made any progress. Yes. All of us sit down in our in seminars and workshops and symposia of this nature to celebrate political and civil rights without paying any attention 
to socioeconomic crisis that have more relevance to our people, the majority of our people. Yes, for the elite who can celebrate right to liberty, freedom of expression, and the rest of them. But for illiterates and the majority of our people who have not gone to school, freedom of expression means nothing to them. Yes, you have the right to life, but if you are sick, you cannot access health, so your right to life is meaningless, or you are jobless, and you are hungry. Uh, these rights, yes, esoteric, you know, we can write papers and praise, you know, uh, those who are promoting rule of law and the rest of them. For us as Africans, we must, ad we must address poverty. Poverty leads to terrorism, leads to drug trafficking and the rest of them. And the youths are taken to crimes all over the place. Yet we say our continent is the richest one, is the richest continent, yet it's the poorest. And for us, talking about human rights, we simply don't bother. We, we just talk about political and civil rights to the detriment of the rights that have meaning for the majority of our people. And that is why we must now try and enforce those provisions of the African Charter on Socioeconomic Crisis, the right of every country in Africa to control their natural resources. It's Article 21 of the African Charter. If you use that provision in the ECOWAS court to fight for the rights of the Niger Delta people who produce oil in Nigeria, but who live in a, you know, a poverty-stricken environment, while uh, Western oil companies, transnational oil companies are you know, taking billions of billions of dollars out of Nigeria, leaving the people to live in poverty. We have also used the provisions of the Charter, Article 17, on right to education. We have a judgment that is set up as well as the Federal Republic of Nigeria to the fact that every Nigerian child is entitled to education for the first nine years. Again, we are battling to get that judgment enforced now. So we have a number of cases in which we have gone to court to enforce socioeconomic rights. And for me, that is the best way to promote human rights in Africa. If we continue to celebrate political and civil rights, yes, our leaders don't bother because it has no meaning to them. But when you begin to fight for the rights of the people to live a meaningful life, you are going to confront them. And that is where we must be prepared for that battle next time around. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, Femi. And um, I'll invite now Tianjana Malua uh, to give us his thoughts on the subject. I had actually pushed it further away because I tend to speak rather loud. Okay. <laughs> uh, but because he was quite passionate and loud, I think I should uh, uh, tone down a bit because uh, my story is a little different from the perspective that he has just given, uh, which is a very important perspective from the uh, grassroots uh, level, uh, people who were involved in uh, pushing uh, the boundaries of human rights protection, etc., uh, from the point of view of NGOs and so on. I want to speak to the issue of regression uh, in uh, the protection of human rights uh, on the continent, but from a very, very uh, singular perspective, and this is the regression at the level of the institution that we call the African Union, how the African Union itself has failed to live up to the promise and expectations uh, that uh, were raised uh, only 16 years ago when the organization uh, was uh, established. And I want to do this by looking at uh, a provision that uh, those of us who were actually involved in drafting the Constitutive Act of the African Union in 2000, 1999-2000 uh, in Libya and then Lome, uh, fought for, and we thought that uh, this was going to open up uh, progress in a particular area. Now, uh, Femi uh, reminded us about the limitations 
of the OAU Charter and uh, the practices of African states uh, in the era of the OAU. When the discussion to establish a new organization to replace the OAU started uh, in earnest in 1999, uh, those who were involved, some of us, thought that this was an opportunity to try and do something different. And uh, what we tried to do then was in the Constitutive Act, uh, as we drafted it and debated it through different uh, drafting committees, ministerial meetings, etc., was to try and place um, a, a what would I say, place a marker on this issue of the role of the organization itself in intervening in member states in order to address human rights violations that states have a primary responsibility uh, to protect human rights as states have committed themselves under various treaties, including the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, but that the organization itself as an institution should also be very clear about its role. So in 2000 in Lome, when we were discussing the Constitutive Act, we also had a side meeting at which the international panel of eminent persons on Rwanda, which had been established by the OAU, delivered its report on the Rwanda genocide. A report that examined the causes of the genocide, the failures of the Organization of African Unity, and the failures of the international community to address the genocide and so on, and what le lessons might have been learned from that. One central lesson uh, from that report which was discussed in Lome, was really the failure of the United Nations Security Council, which uh, uh, Navi talked about earlier, uh, to live up to its obligations under the Charter and do something about the unfolding genocide in Rwanda. We all know the story. And so we had this atmosphere in Lome where ministers of foreign affairs said, well, you know, we are drafting this we need to have a clear provision that clarifies the role of the organization. And that clear provision that they wanted in the draft was what is now Article 4H of the Constitutive Act of the African Union, which says that the union itself, as an organization, is authorized to intervene in member states in cases of, and I quote, grave circumstances, namely genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. And the argument put forward by the proponents of his position was simply that, look, the United Nations Security Council failed us on Rwanda. We cannot afford to go into the future with our hands tied. We need to uh, ensure that the Union itself is empowered to do what it needs to do on the continent rather than wait for the P5 to resolve their differences in New York and for the Security Council to authorize action, etc. The foreign minister of Egypt, then Amr Musa, took the floor and opposed this and uh, reminded us and uh, called upon the legal counsel to respond. He reminded us that uh, what we were about to do was going to be a violation of current international law, that uh, there was no consensus at the time in international law on the issue of the right to humanitarian intervention. Opinion among scholars and practitioners was divided. And in any case, he says, having a provision like this in the Constitutive Act of a regional organization was going to pose a direct challenge to the authority of the UN Security Council, which alone has the power to authorize that kind of intervention, etc. Uh, the foreign minister of Rwanda responded and said, well, tell us where the Security Council and international law was when almost a million people died in a period of 100 days. And that emotive sort of uh, intervention uh, carried the day, but uh, it wasn't just an emotional issue, it was also a rational issue. So we have Article 4H in the Constitutive Act. What we didn't do in Lome was to discuss and agree upon and clarify the threshold criteria for invoking this kind of intervention. And so what you have seen subsequent to 2000, and mind you, this predated the report of the International Commission on Intervention and State Security, which only came out in 2001, which attempted to lay out some of the criteria uh, that would justify 
military intervention in this kind of situations. It also predated the 2005 summit, UN summit de uh, de declaration, etc. But we didn't do this in Lome, and the consequences are all too clear now, because I would suggest that uh, there have been a number of situations in Africa since the adoption of the Constitutive Act where the issue of invoking Article 4H uh, intervention in cases that have been stipulated could have been justified. So you've had uh, Darfur, Sudan, you've had uh, the Central African Republic, South Sudan, and at no point did the AU ever officially bring up the possibility of using Article 4H of the Constitutive Act uh, to intervene in these situations. It only happened much more recently in the Burundi situation. And then we know what has happened in Burundi. So in uh, 2015, December 17, the Peace and Security Council of the African Union met at ambassadorial level and decided that uh, Burundi, because of the violence that had gone on surrounding the attempt, apparently successful attempt, by President Kuruziza to stand for a third term, which uh, was regarded by most of us as uh, a violation not only of the Constitution, but his own earlier promise not to do that. Uh, as a result of all the violence, uh, the African Union, at the level of the Peace and Security Council, decided that uh, this was a case for Article 4H. The Union should intervene in Burundi with uh, a force of arms and so on. Uh, this decision then was taken up in the summit in January, uh, on the 15th of January, or rather 29th of January, by the Peace and Security Council at the level of heads of state. At that meeting, the great Democrats and uh, statesman and scholar of Islamic law and traditions, Yaya Jame, president of the Gambia, Professor. was the only head of state in that meeting. And he took the floor and said, forget about intervention in Burundi. We are sovereign states, and uh, we cannot intervene in Burundi unless the Burundi government itself invites us and so on. And of course, Burundi jumped on that and said, any force that comes to Burundi will be treated as an enemy force, and we are going to fight, fight. even if it is an African Union authorized mission. Uh, a couple of days later, the issue was taken up by the full summit uh, of uh, heads of state and government in a closed session in at Sababa. And uh, in that meeting, Gambia was then joined by other countries, including Chad and South Africa in pushing for a solution that should not involve sending any intervention force. And uh, the argument by Chad and South Africa was basically that uh, military intervention would be premature, that uh, there was still room for discussion and peaceful resolution of this issue, and that uh, Museveni, who was himself also uh, <laughs> facing controversial elections back home, uh, should continue to lead negotiations to find a peaceful solution to the problem in Burundi. And uh, the consensus apparently was that uh, instead of this 5,000 strong force that the African Union had earlier promised, that uh, they would send a delegation of five heads of state, including the President of South Africa, representing the Southern African region, to go and reason with the politicians in Burundi and Kuruziza and so on. Anyway, to cut a long story short, because my time is out, Burundi just demonstrates a number of things, uh, some of which I might come back to in the uh, open discussion. But one is that uh, the apparent promise of normative progress in terms of establishing uh, the normative framework for advancing human rights in Africa has been uh, negated by the actual practice of the organization. So yesterday I talked about how Africa is not short of ideas when it comes to bringing up new ideas about human rights, whether it is establishing the right to development, the right to environment, and so on, even before the United Nations got to that, here, this was the first time that a regional organization had included in its foundational legal <laughs> instrument this notion of the right of humanitarian intervention in situations of 
you know, uh, grave atrocities, etc., etc. And yet the practice post 2000 has not borne this promise out. And so it points to the point that was made by several speakers yesterday, that it is one thing to have all these commitments uh, on paper, it is one thing to sign up to all these treaties, adopt all these things. If there is no will, political will, to implement what uh, obligations have been uh, uh, adopted uh, in these instruments, then uh, we can talk about progress uh, you know, uh, on the continent. And I think Burundi is a perfect example of the failure of the institution itself to live up to its word and try to resolve a situation in a human rights framework that would be faithful to the very idea that we adopted in Lome in 2000. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor. And uh, last but by no means least, uh, Fatir Suro. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. And I always say my name is Sarur, and therefore I'm always the last speaker. And unfortunately, <laughs> everybody would have said everything I wanted to say. Um, let me start by saying that I probably will disappoint you by saying I'm not a human rights lawyer. But I am a development and peace building practitioner. I have, as we say in French, roulé ma boss all over Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, and so on. And as such, for me, I breathe human rights, and it's in my guts. And so, over the past day and this morning, we've heard quite a lot about the structures, the mechanisms, the policies, the constitutions, everything that exists in order to support human rights. And yet the fact that we are talking today about it means that it's not enough. And so what I'd like to propose to do in order not to bore you with repeating the same thing is basically giving you the other perspective. So we heard the policies, the constitutions and everything under the sun in Africa and beyond. I'd like to speak through the eyes and the voices of the victims of injustices and human rights violation. And today I would like to bring to you the face of human rights violation. It's the face of your system, my system, my son, my brother, my daughter, etc., etc. Those who live under conflict or leading to conflict and who are the helpless and the hopeless. And I'd like to do it by actually looking at each and every one of us to see whether we feel on an individual basis and a personal basis a moral responsibility to actually stand up against human rights violation. And if I put it the way I put it in the beginning, i.e., do I, Fatih Asrur, if I see that my friend or my neighbor, girls or boys or young men or young women being raped or being beaten, if I stand against that, and if you stand against that, then gradually we will form a collective of civil engagement against human rights violation. I'm sure if I ask you the question, you will not say, no, if I see that my friend Femi is being, whatever, shaken or something, that I would not stand against it. Nobody will dare tell me no. So for me, this is the beginning of how we can actually uphold human rights. We do not need laws and, and rules to regulate that. We need first to have a moral and personal responsibility and engagement, and the laws will only support us. And if we do that, if each and every one of us actually stand to defend the victims of human rights violation, surprisingly, we will form a critical mass of civil society engagement. And we know that change doesn't come from the top down only, but in general, in general, it comes upwards. 
because civil society and every human being, when they come together, they form a compelling force to force, actually, our leaders to do something. If we do that, then we are better able to actually encourage the state to look at how to deal with human rights violation. And we heard constitutions in Africa speak about equal right. Why? Because under colonial rules, we didn't have equal rights. And it looks very good on paper. Our presidents, our speakers always speak about equal rights. And we, the people, including the victims, we vote for those people. But what happens when those very people violate the rights of the people who voted for them? Is that, that is the question that I think we should ask ourselves. So, and beyond the state, we heard yesterday about the ICC, about African commissions to try and deal with these issues. And I think Navi Pillay spoke extensively today, as well as Femi and my friend, about so many situations that we have seen recently, and I speak only to three of them very briefly, where public, publicly human rights violations have been uh, denounced, like South Sudan, my friend spoke about, Central African Republic yesterday, Somalia when I was in Somalia, the reports produced by either Human Rights Watch or other uh, organizations were so damning that even the blind men can see that those violations are there, but unfortunately very little is actually done in practice to um, deal with the victims, to actually support the victims, etc., etc. I give you a simple example. In Somalia, and I'm sure Liz, who must be around here, the Human Rights Watch report was such an important report. We struggled within Somalia and with the African Union, actually, to get something done about the troops. Picture this. You have troops who go to a country to protect the citizens, and yet they are the ones who actually violate the rights of the citizens they were there to protect. Mm, the African Union is like this, you know? It's so shameful to have to acknowledge that the people you selected, they say we select them, we train them. They come like we did in Somalia, we train them in human rights and gender and this and that, Whoops, they go to the street, the little boy there, the women there, the girl there are being raped. Worse, in Somalia, if a girl is raped and a journalist speaks about that rape, guess what? It's not the perpetrator who is apprehended. It's actually the vi victim and the journalist who go to prison. So when we speak about laws, when we speak about structures, when we speak about all those things, I say, sorry, actions speak louder than words. It's good to have laws, but as long as they are not implemented, they are not laws for me. They don't serve a purpose. Why do they not serve a purpose? Because they don't serve justice, as many colleagues yesterday spoke about. And for the victims, and Navi spoke very compellingly about the various investigations and inquiry commissions and this and that. Well, as a victim, when I look at that, I have a lot of hope. I wait for the result. I wait for the result. I wait for the result. And there is no communication about what is the result. Yes, recommendations. I spent my life in the UN. You know, and there are lovely recommendations very nicely put together. But as a victim, if I don't see those recommendations going forward and showing that, A, my rights have been violated, and B, that there is justice, and C, that those perpetrators are held 
to account whether they are the president or whether they are the prime minister or, 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 I will not rest. And for me, that's a very, very important issue. We have seen it, yes. We have seen it in Central Africa, recently South Sudan. South Sudan, who was violating uh, rights of their people, it's the government, it's the rebels, it's the opposing uh, groups. So I will not go on and on to repeat the same thing. Um, what I'm trying to say is that the dichotomy between stating that you support and you uphold human rights and you put in place mechanisms and people within those mechanisms who themselves are actually violating those rights is a big issue we need to, to talk about today. And to me, to conclude, thank you very much, to conclude, immunity is not a word that should be accepted and impunity shouldn't be accepted. And the fight against impunity is actually non-negotiable. That is, to me, what is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fatia. Right, we've got about 35 minutes before the break to, uh, to ask questions and develop uh, certain parts of this discussion. Um, so if you have questions for any of our panelists, uh, our, our microphones are available. Um, and please raise your hand and so we can see you and we can ask you a question. I, I'm going to ask the panelists myself one question, just the one question, maybe a lead <laughs> question. Um, uh, I didn't get a sense of anybody actually answering the question of what developments are the, should be of the most concern. I see there's a lot of uh, problems, obviously, out there, challenges, but which ones are the most concerning one? Is it the regional and uh, or African Union interventions in other countries that leads to abuse by the soldiers, etc.? What are the developments that are most of most concern to you, the panelists? And I'll start with uh, Prof. on my right. Well, for me, I mean, the starting point ought to be uh, the question of whether states are living up to their obligations uh, and uh, the human rights commitments that they have made. Because if states do, in fact, behave in the way that they should uh, in protecting, promoting human rights of their citizens and in preventing violations, then we will not have these crises in Darfur, in Burundi, etc., erupting. So that's the starting point. So for you, that is the biggest? Yes. Ch okay. Um, Femi? Well, for me, the economy of each of our countries. In the 60s, the foundation leaders of the continent took the issue of the economy very seriously. After 500 years of uh, slavery, 100 years of colonialism, and over 50 years of neo-colonialism, we must challenge the IMF and the World Bank that go to each of our countries to insist on devaluation of our currency and devaluation of the lives of our people. We must challenge the imposition of the structural adjustment program on each of our countries that have multiplied poverty in Africa. If our people remain in poverty, there is no way you can talk of rights. A few of us, the elite, can talk about rights. And that was, for me, that was the lesson I drew yesterday. When I watched Obama, President Obama in Cuba, <laughs> Obama was saying, President Castro, in our discussions, you have talked about racism in America, you've talked about the, our expensive electoral system, you have criticized of I mean, uh, exploitation in America. But for us in Cuba, I'm also challenging the fact that you haven't opened up your system. But in this speech, President Obama also recognized that Cuba has been able to address poverty more than any of the other countries in the region. So for us, we must, while we are talking of liberalization, to what extent as any country in the world open his doors completely, as we are being told by IMF and World Bank. Right now in West Africa, 
We are just coming out of the poverty unleashed on our people by the structural adjustment program. We are now being asked to sign what they call the EU partnership agreement, which is a new colonial, you know, agenda to further popularize our people. So uh, for me, I think the economy is so important. Well, thank, thank you, Femi. Um, Fatia, <laughs> Fatia um, same question to you, but then I would like you to also address, if you don't mind, why it is that Africa always wants to blame somebody else for its problems? <laughs> Well, uh, maybe it's always easier to blame somebody. We always say, the madman always say, it's you who is mad, isn't it? Because then you're throwing the responsibility to somebody else. I think um, I'd like to say that probably Africa, in many, many ways, is right to look at to the reasons why it has not advanced as much as it could have, uh, considering the wealth that Africa has, and that's why we were colonized, is to plunder that wealth, considering that in terms of, even though there is um, an equal access to education today compared to, say, 10, 20 years ago, we do have um, a good proportion of people very highly educated, sadly, who escape because um, Africa doesn't encourage them to stay. Um, we also have nice policies. I mean, I look at my government in Algeria after independence, wow, the policies. And I was an, an activist at, as a student. Excellent policies designed to ensure equality. And very good ones, agrarian reform, uh, policy to uh, nationalize the, the oil industry, and so on and so on. On the way, whether it's Algeria or most of Af Africa, there are interferences. Let us not forget that. Interferences that are at our own level as Africans, whereby we get caught. Our leaders, unfortunately, get caught in the desire to either hold the seat and in doing that, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, everything else has no value, or if I'm not holding the seat and I can stay only two years in power, how much can I accumulate during that time? So I'm talking about corruption, which means that, going back to the concept of uh, equality, the resources are not equally distributed amongst its people. And finally, finally, having spent my life moving around and looking at the international actors, and how we engage with them as leaders in our nations. Well, our international actors come to our countries, not necessarily because they love us. Let us be frank about it, and I will be frank about it. They come either for geopolitical influence and or for economic greed, right? Greed. Reasons, yes, but greed as well. Take as much as you can while you can. But the flip side of it, which is sad, is that some of our leaders allow this to happen because they feel a personal interest. So coming back to the IMF and, and the World Bank, actually my, did, I did my MA on that one, is basically to look at how when you're leading and you accept that you are being dictated certain policies, and I do say dictated. You accept them because you see a personal interest there, either political and or economic. So I think we need to call a spade a spade. Certainly not to say, you know, it's only neocolonialism, but that as well as how we make out of it, which is very important. Right. I'll stop here. Thank right, you. thank you. The floor is open for questions from the audience. Um, just raise your hand wherever you are. Charles, at the back, and then Mr. Golson. Thank you Here. so much. Um, where do I start? Um, so a, a question for each of the panelists, very briefly. Uh, firstly, Femi, um, your point about Article 34.6, um, I think it's an excellent one. And I've always been curious about that provision, especially when you think about 
the context from which it was copied, which is essentially the ICJ system, where states have to give their consent. And you're looking at separate questions, not of state responsibility, but really human rights violations. So for you, I wonder, in light of the almost disjunction between the conversation we were having on the first panel about international criminal jurisdiction and what the AU is doing, and besides that, a protocol that will still require the declarations. I would really love to hear your views on this, especially given the challenge that you have raised at the, at the court in Arusha. Uh, for Tia, I, I love the, the 4 H history and that being, we make, at least the academic side, as you know, we're making a lot of deal of this and basically crediting the AU. But here's where the rubber hits the road, right? Are we able to follow through the commitments? And part of the difficulty, it seems to me, with Burundi was that we were not sure. A lot of people were concerned about the crisis escalating. So in a sense, there's a factual change on the ground in terms of the circumstances. So to what extent is this a case of where not so much about the political will, uh, but a change on the ground itself that would merit deeper engagement with the state that is on the, on the hot seat, essentially Burundi, which as you know, then got elected to the PSC itself. So I, I wonder whether you could sort of develop that and, and give me your perspective on this. And, and for uh, Fatia, the, I mean, I think it comes down to what you said, it's about people, right? You can have all the laws and the instruments and all of that's about people. How do we make that next step? So what do you see as the hopeful picture right now? Where do we go from here, giving all this normative, you know, architecture that we have in terms of African peace and security, they were talking about African governance. I mean, there's a lot of institutions that have been built, a lot of treaties and protocols that have been adopted, but how do we give effect to them? And what do you see as hopeful, giving your on the ground, grassroots perspective? Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Uh, Jim Goldston, um, thank you, for panelists. Um, you've painted an extraordinarily bleak picture. Um, at least as I understood it. And I'm wondering um, what constructive insights you would recommend? What can we draw from the lessons um, of the history that you depict for developing effective justice systems in Africa to address the kinds of crimes that are the subject of this uh, symposium? Um, I mean, and, and in that regard, how does one draw on what I hear um, from Fatia's comments of the, the power of victims' voices and what victims want? Femi, you suggest, if I understand, that in fact um, poverty is the ultimate um, uh, uh, crime or injustice and um, that that is in fact what is not being addressed. We all talk about civil and political rights, but, but, but economic and social rights are not getting sufficient attention. If that is true, what are the implications of that for the crimes that are at issue here and how one develops effective justice systems um, and, and mechanisms? Are there lessons to be learned from those signs of what I took to be hope from, from this and other uh, panels? You mentioned the, uh, the ECOWAS Court of Justice as an effective mechanism in West Africa. What are the lessons of how that was created and how that has been used and how that can be strengthened? People have earlier in other conversations referred to the, the uh, special court on the, that's dealing with the Habre situation in Senegal. Are there lessons from that that we can draw um, in creating future justice mechanisms that are effective in Africa? Are there, are there concrete recommendations that you would have about how to build on the voices of victims to draw on the power and the, and the concerns that you've reflected in a way that would allow us to actually um, learn how we can constructively do better. Um, if, the, if, if everybody agrees, including folks in The Hague, right, that domestic national systems are the best, local justice is preferred, the ICC is a last resort. So what constructively can be done to actually give impetus to the development of those national mechanisms? Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, and the final one, um, we'll take the one, uh, gentleman at the back, and then the next round. I'll come to you, madam. Thank you, Joseph. Um, just to he keen to hear some words of wisdom from any one of the panels or anyone here. Um, as you may know, there is a looming danger to the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Uh, I don't know how many of you have followed it up, but the commission took a bold step and gave accreditation to an LGBTI organization based in South Africa 
called Coalition of African Lesbians um, in one of his ordinary sessions last year. Uh, the report of the commission went to the AU Executive Committee Council and the council instructed the African Commission to withdraw the decision it made in respect of issuing an observer status to such an organization, arguing that this is contrary to African culture and African charter and etc. Uh, so there's a bit of bouncing going and off going on around this. A group of organizations have filed an advisory opinion from the African court. The African court possibly might bounce it back to the commission and etc. So this is a real live trade to the independence of the only, the single human rights protection mechanism in the continent. Any thoughts on how we can reverse this trade to the Commission? Thanks. All right. We'll take those three questions uh, this round and then come back to some more. So, gentlemen, do you want to start first? I, there's quite a few questions, Prof. Well, um, I, I think uh, it's uh, the question uh, from Charles Jello that uh, I need to address. Uh, just to say this, I think uh, you're quite right. Things changed on the ground. I think the AU response or non-response, depending on how you want to look mm -hmm. at it on Burundi, mm -hmm. uh, can be explained uh, in terms of uh, three uh, issues, three developments. One was that um, as in the earlier days of the discussion on Darfur, I think within the AU, a lot of time was spent initially on internal arguments about the nature of the conflict that was going on in, Taf in uh, Burundi. Is, just, is this just a little local difficulty yeah. concerning interpretations of the constitution and whether or not Kurunziza should be allowed to stand for another term, et cetera, et cetera? Is it simply a constitutional dispute? Or is it something that is developing, evolving towards uh, something that we might call uh, a grave circumstance as defined in Article 4H, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that is partly the issue of the threshold. Uh, is this something that justifies intervention by the African Union in terms of Article 4H uh, or, the, or, the, uh, or the Constitutive Act? That is number one. Number two is that uh, those who thought it was actually something that justified intervention we are not quite able to explain exactly what that threshold was. Uh, it is only subsequently, much later on, that the Burundi authorities themselves, no less person than the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General about two weeks ago, have admitted publicly that they have discovered mass graves with at least 87 bodies. But uh, when this discussion was taking place in December 2015, the scale of what had gone on was not quite apparent to some of the people who were arguing for intervention and so on. So the nature of the conflict, the threshold uh, criteria for intervention, etc., etc. Thirdly, I think the AU, as we discovered in Darfur, because I was involved in Darfur as part of the uh, African Union high-level panel, the so-called uh, Mbeki panel, uh, in investigations in Darfur, as in Central African Republic and so on, the AU has at times conveniently used the United Nations as an excuse to step back and say, well, we actually would have liked to intervene in Burundi, but uh, the UN is also perhaps the appropriate body to do this and we can do joint interventions or joint uh, peacekeeping arrangements or whatever, and uh, the AU then steps back. We have seen this with UNAMID in, uh, in Darfur the AU basically ignored the excellent report that the Mbeki panel delivered to the AU, which was welcomed by the international community, by the AU, by NGOs, by everybody. But once that report was submitted, everybody forgot about it, and the AU just said, well, we are operating in Darfur through UNAMID, mm -hmm. which isn't really doing much, because the situation of the victims of the violations in Darfur, whether you call them genocide or whether it's just mass atrocities, whatever label you use, the situation of the victims has not changed, etc. It is the same thing with Burundi. Uh, the presence uh, of the United Nations in a certain way has given cover to the AU to just say, okay, there are, uh, you know, there is pushback from the Burundi government. We don't want to go in there with a force that will be met with fire by the Burundi army 
and we start a fight that might lead to something else. So we'll step back and just continue with peaceful negotiations with authorities. And then things changed on the ground, of course, because Grunziza, for good or bad, was able to push through his so-called re-election, and uh, internally he proclaimed himself the legitimate government of Burundi. Now the AU then turned around and said, well, if we go in, are we actually going to go in and do regime change and remove Kuronziza? Uh, and this is where even the East African community, the outgoing president of Tanzania, Kikweti, uh, President uh, Kenyatta and uh, Museveni and others, President Kagame, who has an interest in this third term business because he is getting ready for his own extension, all these presidents in the region <laughs> We are silent. They didn't think that going to Burundi, whether as an AU force or UN, etc., was going to be helpful. And people started characterizing some of that talk as talk about regime change. Now, the irony is that uh, it is the same uh, AU which also adopted the Charter on uh, Democracy and Governance, which defines what happens in Burundi or what has happened in Burundi as really an unconstitutional change of government. But uh, when it becomes convenient, they ignore that. And this is why I keep coming back to the point. It's not a shortage of the normative uh, you know, uh, uh, rules and the normative framework. The norms have been established in various uh, you know, instruments, etc. It's just the uh, either inability or unwillingness of these countries to live up to uh, what those norms require them to do. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Femi? Yeah. Uh, again, um, taking it from where Prof left it, with respect to Burundi, um, I, I think a lot of the blame should really go to the leaders in the region. Uh, if you compare what happened in Burundi with West Africa again, we've had the problem in Niger, in Burkina Faso, um, and there was another country where the leaders in the region, in West Africa, have come out, first of all, to suspend any country where you are talking of third time or a military coup, and then some sanctions are imposed. And here, Nigeria has been quite wonderful, you know, even though you cannot fix its own internal affairs, but in terms of ensuring that leaders are not allowed to manipulate the constitution in the region, uh, Nigeria has been forthcoming. If you take the case of uh, Niger, for instance, the president of Nigeria, the Obasanjo, just summoned the guy and threatened that Nigeria will invade if you do not, I mean, if you continue to manipulate the constitution because we share a border and crisis there will, you know, will lead to instability in Nigeria. And of course, the guy believed, oh, this man, a former general, you know can really carry out his threat. And I also recall an instance where the president of Sao Tome was visiting Nigeria, and there was a coup. Now, the president, I think Obasanjo you then, uh, you know, just simply called the young man, you know, your president is here, I want him to return to the country. In your own interest, you know, just a platoon of Miami can get you out of the place. And they now have to negotiate, you know. What do you want? We're not going to allow them to try you for treason. And that was the end of the coup. So I, I, I think we also need to develop the capacity of the countries and the civil society in these countries to play some active role yes. in getting these dictators out of power. Yes. Um, I do recall an instance in Accra when the ECOWAS was meeting. And this guy in uh, Gambia, uh, Professor uh, uh, you know, Sheikh, Sheikh Alaji, Yaya Jame, wanted to become president, I mean, the chairman of the ECOWA. Of course, we surrounded the hall, civil society leaders, and there was no way this was going to be possible. And Oba Senior of Nigeria simply told the man, we're in trouble outside, there's no way we can hand over this organization to you because you have problems in your country. So we must have such interventions, particularly the civil society. And that again goes to other issues that have been raised. Uh, yes, the question of poverty, uh, I take the case of Nigeria. The Boko Haram, if you read all the literature on Boko Haram, you discover that the root cause is poverty and ignorance. Uh, young men, 
who have been dislocated by the system and they see corruption around them all over the place. And for those who are not familiar with the rate of corruption in Nigeria, um, it's no longer what you are used to elsewhere. It's now a family affair. We now have a situation whereby a father and two of his sons are charged to the same court for corruption. They are locked up in the same cell. Whereas in those days, if a child was found, was charged with stealing, the parents will almost disown him. But now the father, you know, the mother and the kids are charged for corruption. It is as bad in the country. Now, we had Boko Haram, money made for procurement of arms and armament was stolen by military I mean, uh, 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 leaders and their civilian collaborators. There was an instance where helicopter, two helicopters were to be bought for about uh, $70 million. Uh, these guys went to buy some fake second-hand ones and put some of their colleagues to fly in it and they crashed and died, you know. Yet they took away about $139 million. So, in fact, in Nigeria now, for the fear that you could be found out in the bank, what some of the military leaders do now is to put money in, a, you have bunkers in your house, so you bury dollars inside the bunkers or safety tanks and the rest of them. So it, it is as primitive. Now, when you have this kind of situation, you can't talk of human rights. Because these are people who have taken the entire wealth of the country. They privatized, and then you go to Britain and US and the rest of them. These funds have been stolen. Yet, uh, Transparency International, I don't know when anybody is representing Transparency International, we have had this problem. Transparency International, you are right. Nigeria is corrupt. Cameroon is corrupt. Ghana is corrupt. Yes, good. But what of Switzerland? Switzerland. There are warehouses, all the stolen money in all our countries, you know. Yes. It's, it's not corrupt. It's not the leading corrupt country in the world. So we, we have to interrogate the international economic order and be able to place our people in the right perspective. And on, on poverty and corruption, I believe we need political actions. We need the civil rights movement to do much more so that we can fight the leaders who are corrupt. And the final one. Well, the civil society here tried, just like we did in Nigeria when Abashi came to Nigeria. Uh, we went to court, he ran away. It was the same experience here. We also must do that to uh, President Bush or Blair, if they come to any of the African countries, we should also go to court. And for me, this is the only way to get credibility for the ICC. But if we simply uh, leave African leaders, hey, you people, please, Let's not waste so much time on AU leaders. We need to mobilize the civil society. When Shastelo, Obasanjo didn't want Shastelo out of Nigeria. As a matter of fact, quietly, the customs officer that arrested Shastelo was dismissed from the public service. I just last week, I just got him, I just got his dismissal converted to retirement. So I, I think a lot of these actions have to be taken by civil society and the progressive extraction of the political parties in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Satya. Satya, thank can, you. I, can I beat the enthusiasm? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. Thank you very much. Um, amongst the comment, I heard the word uh, bleak picture and the implication and local justice. And I'd like maybe to build up on two or three things, just reflecting. I'm a provocative person, and that's why I use the, the bleak picture, because only bleak pictures can make us react. I think that's very, very important. But it's the reality that we have in relation to human rights um, on the ground. And what can we do about it? And I link it to the issue of, uh, of addressing poverty. I think through addressing poverty, we are better able to create again, critical masses that are able and confident to challenge systems. And that is very, very important. And to me, to be able to ensure that actually all those people who have suffered uh, human rights violation, that they are able to see something happen, we need to empower them. And to empower them is through education, through economic rights, but also through 
a deep conviction that systems put in place and people to manage those systems, you can trust them. You can trust them to actually address your needs and that they can protect you if you actually speak up against violations of human rights. So that's very, very important for victims to be able to come out and to speak and to pursue their quest for justice. They need to trust us and they need to trust the system. And fortunately, I think today that is not the case because they know and we have seen and when I spoke about Somalia or Central Africa and so on, not only the local systems, but the UN, my organization, beautiful reports, investigations, and so on. And then suddenly, conspiracy of silence, it dies down. So we need to address that. We need to see where all those processes, or the victims need to see, where would they lead? And that would be very empowering. And if we empower them, again, they will cre create or support what you were talking about, which is basically, do we need to go to the ICC or the regional, or do we need to invest in the local? Uh, I won't even call it structure, because for me, structure is formal. I would talk about ways of seeking justice and accountability, and I think we need to, and we can only do it by actually investing a lot more in civil society. Why? Not to be an alternative to formal structures, but to be there as a mechanism to actually <coughs> ensure that those we elect do abide by their platform for elections or the actual declarations they, they need to do. So really, having the state and having the face that would hold them to account to what they actually um, promise to do for the people. And, and that cannot be possible unless, and Femi said it, is building the capacity. What capacity? Everybody thinks capacity is going to school, learning in workshops, no. It's to build the capacity so that people see that they are a powerful agent of change. And they trust that force they have within them to be able to actually challenge systems. And they can. We've seen it. We've seen it in various places all over the world, that when we help that potential to unleash, revolutions took place. Look at the civil rights movement in America. Who would have thought? Look at the movement here in, in uh, South Africa. But unless we do that to help people realize that they have a power to change things, things will not change. And we will always have leaders in government who will do what they want. And to that one, just to, to end, what we try to do with people before they go to elections is really make them understand that in voting for, let's say, Fatiha, terrible Fatiha, you know that you're voting for somebody who will be able to protect you, protect your rights, and ensure that you're no longer poor. But if you're not sure about that, then maybe you should think about an alternative, whereas people don't think about that. They go and I vote for Bettina, like her, or for Femi, he speaks well, but then maybe they are not going to be there. So that kind of meaningful citizen's right is very, very important when you exercise it that you know. You can go back to Bettina and say, I elected you, what are you doing for me? For me, that's very important. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, just a quick word uh, in response partly to what uh, Jim uh, Godson said asked about the historical experiences and what lessons we can draw from that, particularly uh, in relation to the power of certain voices. I'll just say this, that uh, yes, we must identify what these voices are, and uh, in doing so, we must also ask ourselves what uh, the objective of these, uh, you know, uh, of these voices is, particularly if they're external voices. 
Uh, my colleagues have talked about neocolonialism and all that. I would just say, uh, perhaps using different terminology, that we need to be careful of how external voices also impact upon the way that uh, we are able to advance or regress in uh, human rights in Africa. So Libya is a good example. Uh, one of the things that has affected the responses of the African Union to post-Libya situations is precisely how certain external voices, including apparently the UN Security Council, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, sold uh, the uh, idea of uh, you know uh, regime change without actually calling it regime change. If you ask Africans now, uh, particularly Libyans, whether they are better off, worse now than they were before Gaddafi, well, they'll probably they have a very uh, you know uh, different answers. But uh, the general consensus is that things have gotten worse. So what is the effect of these external voices? What are these external voices? Uh, my colleague talked about uh, the role of leaders in West Africa to tamp down attempts at uh, unconstitutional uh, you know, regime takeovers or changes of regimes, etc., in Niger and uh, Burkina Faso. But I should also remind him, without uh, downplaying and without disrespecting the West African leaders, mm -hmm. that uh, France was critical in actually persuading Blaise Compaore to drive across to Ivory Coast to avoid bloodshed and further conflict in Burkina Faso and so on. So we have certain external voices that go beyond those uh, West African leaders who apparently uh, did a good job. I, I don't know if Obasanjo was always a positive uh, uh, you know, voice. Uh, <laughs> there are times that uh, he also tended to behave uh, rather worried. But uh, anyway, that would be uh, for another conversation. Right. I want to say thank you very much to our panel uh, with a round of applause, please, for um, Femi Falana, Tien Juna, Malua, and Fatia Surat.